The Teaching of the Nicolaitans, Which Jesus Hates, Part 1. This is solid food for radical disciples during these very last days. If you'd like to have the playlist of the videos of all of these sessions, as well as the accompanying PowerPoint presentation slides, just email me at Elijah003 at gmail.com. Uh, I'm also on WhatsApp at plus one two eight one five zero seven eight five one seven. So we're going to be recording this session and this contact information I will provide once again at the very end of this session. Romans, excuse me, Revelation 2, verse 6. Jesus said to this church, to the angel in this church, but you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. This teaching is mentioned a second time, Revelation 2, 15. Jesus said to another church, likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. Therefore, it would be in our favor to hate the teaching of the Nicolaitans. It will be in our favor. And so we are going to learn what the teaching of the Nicolaitans actually means. Because again, it will be in our favor before the eyes of the Lord to hate this teaching. Note, after returning home from serving as missionaries and pastors in Indonesia from 1978 to 1987, uh, my wife, Lucille, and I, we planted churches, and we actually served as pastors in New York City and also in the city of Houston for a period of 11 years. Therefore, we have, passed, we have served as pastors for a total of 20 years. And so we understand the pressures and the temptations faced by local pastors today. We have been there. We have done that. Now, we're going to begin by looking at the job description of the fivefold ministry according to Scripture, according to Ephesians. Let's look at the job description of ministers. According to Ephesians 4, verse 12, the job of pastors, apostles, evangelists, prophets, and teachers, that's the fivefold ministry, the job is to equip God's people for works of service. Equipping God's people to serve, to do good works, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That's a huge mouthful. And that is the job description of us ministers of the gospel, to equip God's people for works of service until all of us become mature until all of us attain to the whole measure of the fullness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. But due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which has infiltrated the church, the fivefold ministry has clearly failed to do its job. We all, meaning all of God's people, we have definitely not become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We have not. That is very clear. Just look at your typical Christian. Just look at the church. We have not become mature. We have not attained to the whole measure of the fullness of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Now, who is primarily responsible for this failure? In today's church, pastors dominate the fivefold ministries. It is not biblical, but that is reality in the church today. We pastors, we dominate ministry. In most churches today, the spiritual authority of most of the believers depends primarily on the teaching they receive from their pastor. 
That is reality. They sit under their pastor once a week or maybe twice a week. Therefore, when all of God's people have not become mature and have not attained to the whole measure of the fullness of Jesus Christ, the blame can be laid mostly at the feet of us pastors. Now, how has this come about? It is due to the effect of Western culture on the church in the West, which has spread to much of the church elsewhere in the world. And this in turn is due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. So Western culture plays a huge part in the condition of the church today, Western culture. Now, in the early church, before the teaching of the Nicolaitans took root, it was not pastors who laid the foundation of the church and led the church, no, but rather the apostles. Now, let's look at how the culture of the West has affected the church in the West, which later spread elsewhere in the world. We're going to focus on the culture of the West and how it has affected the Church of Jesus Christ. The culture in the West teaches that bigger is better. Bigger and thus richer means that we are successful. This is the culture in the West. And due to the immense influence of Hollywood, we dream of becoming a rich and famous celebrity. Now, this very same culture has infected the Church of Jesus Christ in the West, and therefore around much of the world as well. Most of us pastors, of course, we would like our church to grow and to keep growing because that is a mark of success. And of course, it's for the glory of God, we would like to say. Well, how do we bring that about? How do we keep our church growing? Well, one way, among others, is to keep our sheep from wandering off to another church or being stolen by a nearby sheep-stealing church. At least that way, we won't shrink in size. Now, it should be noted at the outset that there are different kinds of earthly benefits to be gained by us pastors if we pastor a large church. For example, we receive acknowledgement and respect from other local pastors who pastor a smaller church and from the local, from the body of Christ in general. For example, uh, we can get elected president of the local pastors association if we pastor the biggest church in town. I believe that is quite common. And there will be things like self-esteem, uh, satisfaction, and likely financial benefits, to name some. Now, most of us pastors, of course, we do not see these benefits as the primary motivation to grow our church in size. No, no. Rather, we see them, if anything, as only what I call fringe benefits to the accomplishment of reaching many lost souls for the kingdom of God and feeding the Lord's precious lambs. They're just fringe benefits. Why not? Again, we say glory to God. Now, pastoring a large church can also be a reward for skillful leadership and years and years and years of hard work. Yes. Now, we pastors, we also know that it is our responsibility to make disciples of God's people. That's our responsibility. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19. This is the Great Commission. Jesus said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We are to make disciples of God's people, not just believers, but disciples. 
And what are we to teach them? We are to teach them to obey everything. Obey, obey. Not just to believe, but to obey all of the Lord's commandments. And we pastors have fallen far short in obeying the Great Commission, Matthew 28. Now, so we all, meaning all believers, are to be discipled according to the Great Commission. We are to be taught everything in order for us to obey all of God's commands, in order for us to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We are to be taught everything, to obey all of the Lord's commands. But do we pastors really rejoice if many mature disciples leave our church? To serve the Lord elsewhere to make more disciples? Do we really rejoice? And this is after they have become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ in our church under our ministry. Do we really rejoice? Hmm. Perhaps not. Perhaps not. Why not? Well, let me share the following. We pastors, we generally do not like seeing our, quote, members, unquote, leave our church. Now, in the New Testament, in the early church, in the book of Acts, there is no mention of church members, not at all. So uh, later, we're going to analyze this term members as in church members. Now, this is what we pastors think, okay? God forbid if our mature members leave and start their own church to compete with us and then steal our sheep. God forbid. Now, I once heard the following about a megachurch in my city. I heard that this megachurch, when they hire a new pastor, they make him sign an agreement as part of the contract. And the agreement says, if you ever leave this church, you may not start another church within 50 miles of any of our campuses, of any of our churches, within 50 miles. You cannot do that. Sounds like business, doesn't it? Hmm. So how do we keep our precious members from leaving our church, along with their tithes and offerings, of course? Well, one unspoken and often unintended way of keeping members from leaving our church is to keep them from becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Hmm. In that way, they stay spiritually dependent on us and they remain under our authority. Hmm. Hopefully, this is done unconsciously and not deliberately by us pastors and servants of the God, servants of God. Hopefully, we're not doing it deliberately. We're doing it unconsciously because of the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. But you know, one time my wife and I, we were in Germany and we were teaching in a local church, teaching the Elijah Challenge, teaching the believers in the church how to heal the sick and cast out demons in jesus name uh the pastor's wife she came to us after the teaching and she said to us in so many words she said but if you train our people to do this then they won't have to depend on us anymore to 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 pray for the sick so maybe this isn't such a good idea this is what the wife of the pastor told us Hmm, well, that was very conscious and very deliberate. She did not want her people to become independent of her in terms of ministry. She wanted them to remain dependent upon her and her husband so that they would keep on coming with their tithes and offerings so they could continue paying their bills and put food on the table. Sadly, this is what we call reality. Now, some of us pastors might think in that way unconsciously for the sake of our, what I call, job security. 
since we pastors, we earn our livelihood as paid professionals. And we must keep the offerings coming in every Sunday so that we can pay our bills and so that we can put food on the table to feed our family, our dear wife and our precious children. Now, humanly speaking, of course, this is understandable. But what about Matthew 6.33? Jesus commands us, seek first his kingdom, seek first his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. All these things that you need will be given to you as well. Food, clothing, they will be given to you as well. What about that? But due to the Nicolaitan structure of the church today, we pastors unconsciously keep our members as spiritual children, or at most as adolescents, so that they remain dependent upon us so that they don't leave our nest, our church, to start their own fruitful ministries so that we can keep paying the bills and therefore we can stay in business. Now, if they start their own ministry, who knows if they might steal our sheep? God forbid. Interestingly, that is why I am called teacher and not pastor. Let me tell you why. If I am called pastor, it means I have a church. And that means I can potentially steal sheep from another church to come to my church instead. And other pastors will therefore feel threatened if I am called pastor. To me, it's very, very sad. This reflects the sad state of the church as a result of the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. Now we can begin to understand why Jesus hates it. Now, in the early church in the book of Acts, the matter of churches stealing sheep from one another did not exist. The teaching of the Nicolaitans at that time was still in its infancy. Now, here's a question. Don't we expect our own biological children to leave our nest after they grow up and hopefully become more successful than us? Shouldn't this be the hope of a pastor who is after the Lord's heart? I would think so. But the Nicolaitan structure of the church forces us pastors to think and to hope otherwise. We are forced to think otherwise. Now, with the Nicolaitan structure of the church now, where believers are fed only once or twice a week, few believers can attain to our professional status as pastors, as ministers, by doing what is necessary to gain ecclesiastical titles like reverend. The great majority of believers will not reach mature adulthood in Christ. They will not. They will not be trained and equipped for fruitful ministry. No, they will not. Instead, they are taught to expect us professional ministers to babysit them and take care of their many needs, since that is what pastors are paid to do. We babysitters, we pastors, thus we relieve God's people of the responsibility of studying God's word for themselves. And this is in accordance with 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, where Paul said, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. And I believe these words are not only for Timothy, but for every disciple of Jesus Christ. But due to the current Nicolaitan structure of the church, which has reduced the church to a mostly human organization with members and membership, just like a social club, we pastors end up feeding God's word to his people only once or twice a week 
and that is during scheduled events. Now, how often do you feed your children at home when they were still young? Of course, two or more likely three times a day. But how often are God's people fed today? Once, twice a week. How can God's children possibly grow to maturity in Christ, being fed only once or twice a week in church, in that building that we call church? Impossible. And when we do feed God's people in church on Sundays, it is mostly milk with a bit of the gospel sprinkled in instead of solid food. That's what we should be given disciples, solid food. We pastors, we also spend time and effort to teach our members how to overcome the many trials and challenges in life in the affluent West. Now, this would appear to be very much needed. Yeah, you need to teach your people how to overcome life's challenges. But what if instead we teach them to focus on obeying the Lord's commands despite their circumstances. What if we do that? Again, I believe the Lord's magnificent promise in Matthew 6 will come into play. And there Jesus, Jesus promises, Jesus tells his disciples, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? How am I going to pay the bills? I have a family to feed. Oh, Jesus says the pagans, the unbelievers, the idol worshipers run after all these things as well. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. Seek first to make Jesus your king. And if Jesus is your king, you will obey his commands Seek first to be righteous as he is righteous. Aim for perfection. And all these things will be given to you as well. What about that? My wife and I have personally witnessed this wondrous promise fulfilled in our lives over and over and over and over again. But under the Nicolaitan system, God's people cannot mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. They cannot. Therefore, they will remain in our church as members and serve under our authority as lay people. Hmm. We don't encourage them to leave the nest to start their own family. No, we will lose their precious tithes and offerings. <laughs> How are, you, how are we going to pay our bills if so many people leave our church with their tithes and offerings? To repeat, very few of us pastors deliberately keep our people from maturing, although some might. It is rather an unwitting course of action predetermined by our culture and the Nicolaitan system which Jesus hates. It has resulted in the traditional structure of church, which is prevalent in the great majority of churches in the world today. Real pastors today love God and want to do his will, yes. But because of the Nicolaitan system to which the pastors were exposed and in which we grew up spiritually, we pastors... We don't know of any other way. This is all we know. The Nicolaitan system in the West, which limits the feeding of the word of God to most members to only once or twice a week, often inside a church building, stunts their growth and prevents them from reaching maturity as fruit-bearing disciples, as the Lord desires for all his people. We pastors, we say that we desire all of our people to mature to the whole measure and fullness of Christ. Yes. But at the same time, we don't like seeing people leave our church. 
because of the various pressures on us, both inner pressures and outer pressures for our church to grow, to grow in size, to grow in membership. What pressures? Well, <laughs> the underlying reality is that we pastors, we need to pay for the rent. We need to pay for the mortgage. We need to pay the utilities, the staff salaries. At times, we need to pay for the construction of additional facilities or of a church school and so forth and so forth. But did the early church in Acts face such pressures? No, they did not. Do house churches face such pressures? No, they do not. They don't have to pay rent, mortgage, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. No. Moreover, with a growing congregation and a nice-looking facility, we pastors, we can look good in front of other pastors. We can receive invitations to speak elsewhere, where, of course, we will receive a generous honorarium on top of the salary that the church pays us. Wow. And then, so we can live the abundant life which Jesus promised his people. You remember John 10, 10? I have come to give them life, to give them life abundantly. You remember that? And so we don't mind uh, receiving a hefty salary so we can enjoy the abundant life which Jesus promises his disciples. So let's look at John 10, 10 and find out exactly what did Jesus mean when he talked about abundant life. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Okay, there we have the expression abundant life. Jesus came to give us abundant life. Exactly what did he mean? Was Jesus referring to material abundance in this world? Or was he referring to spiritual abundance? Well, let's see. Let's have a look at what Jesus said in John 12, verse 25. Anyone who loves their life will lose it. If you love your life in this world, you will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Hmm. Now, so in John 10, 10, was Jesus referring to material abundance or spiritual abundance in this world? He was referring, of course, to spiritual abundance. He was teaching his disciples to hate their life in this world. So, a pastor can experience the following conflict. There's a conflict between the numerical growth of his congregation and discipling his congregation to full maturity. There's a conflict. These two oppose one another. It is nearly impossible to do both of these well. Which side might win the conflict? To see the church grow in numbers? To see the offering plate fuller and fuller and fuller every Sunday? Or discipling his congregation to full maturity in Christ Jesus? Which side do you think will win this conflict? It's pretty obvious. It's clear from the current state of the church which side usually wins the conflict. And given the human nature of us pastors, that's not surprising at all. But there are some exceptions. There is a servant of God named Francis Chan who used to be a pastor of a megachurch in the United States. But a few years ago, he left that mega church here in the U.S., and he left for the mission field in Asia. I believe he went to Hong Kong to plant house churches instead. Now, question, will our own children at home become responsible and productive adults if we, their parents, force them to remain at home as our dependents and never teach them and never train them with the goal of their someday launching out on their own as responsible and fruitful adults? That's a rhetorical question, by the way. We pastors might not mind 
if a few of our people mature and a few of them become missionaries or evangelists. We won't mind. We'll say, praise God. And we might even support them financially. But clearly, there is a definite limit to such a scenario. Not only will we be losing tithing people, there will be an outflow of funds as well as to support them, especially if there are many people who want to leave our nest and serve the Lord full time overseas. Such a church in today's Nicolaitan system will have difficulty surviving financially. But again, what about Matthew 6.33? Seek first his kingdom. Seek first to enlarge his kingdom. Seek first to have Jesus your king. Obey his commands. Become righteous as he is righteous. And all these things will be given to you as well. What about that? We so often forget Matthew 6, 33. That's our human nature. Now, many pastors, we work very hard and we do our very best under the circumstances in which we minister. Yet the church is mostly weak and effective as I see it today, especially in making disciples of all nations. No, there are very few disciples. Most believers are just what I call Christians. The word Christian today is not what it referred to in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. In the book of Acts, the word Christian was equivalent in meaning to disciple, a disciple who gave up everything to follow Jesus. But today, we are weak and effective in making disciples of our people, making disciples of all nations. Now. Question, why does a pastor have to spend time and energy just putting out fires in his congregation? Why does it seem that our job as a pastor is mostly teaching God's people how to just survive life's many difficulties now and to receive his blessings mostly in this life? Why do we concentrate on things in this life mostly? Why can't we pastors focus on teaching God's people how to store up for themselves treasures in heaven instead of mostly on earth? Maybe that's why I'm so glad I'm not a pastor anymore. Hallelujah. Now I can train radical disciples to store up treasure for themselves in heaven in the next age. Matthew 6, 20, Jesus said, he commanded his disciples, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And I speak from my own personal experience as a pastor. I know the challenges, the pressures that are faced by pastors. And so that's why I'm glad I'm no longer a pastor. Why can't we spend much time training God's people to do the good works which God prepared in advance for them to do? Why can't we spend time doing that? Look what Jesus said in Revelation 3, verse 8. Jesus says, I know your deeds, your deeds not your faith, your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. He's talking to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. I know your deeds. Oh, your deeds have been great. Why can't we spend more effort training God's people to accomplish the deeds that he prepared for them instead of simply teaching them how to survive life's many challenges in this life and to prosper here in this life? Why can't we spend more time training God's people how to serve the Lord effectively, to bear fruit for the Lord effectively, to store their treasure in heaven? And if they do that, all these things will be provided for them. For seek his kingdom, for seek his righteousness, and all these other things will be taken care of for you. So there is something wrong with the system which leaves most believers bearing little eternal fruit. We're just barely making it to heaven. And that system is called the Nicolaitan structure of the church. There's something wrong with this system. We teach believers to be totally dependent on God, meaning we pastors. We teach 
We teach you to depend on God totally, but it turns out that they end up depending on God through us, their pastor. That's what happens eventually. Generally, only we pastors can preach and teach. Only we pastors can minister to the sick. After all, that's what we're paid to do. Okay, this is what we see in a traditional church, in the Nicolaitan church. Only the pastor can preach. Only the pastor can minister to the sick. Only the pastor can minister Holy Communion. And generally, all this takes place only in church on a Sunday morning. And this has caused most Christians to become helpless, which could be good for us, Pastor, since our members become dependent on us. That's good for job security. They keep on coming every Sunday with their tithes and offerings. So it's primarily the pastor's job to preach the gospel and evangelize. That's what we're paid to do, right? It's not the job of the church members. And that way, we have become professionals who are paid to do what pastors typically do as paid professionals who are separated and elevated far above the lay people. That's the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. And if we hate it, that will be in our favor. That's the teaching of the Nicolaitans, Jesus hates. Many pastors, we do not train, we do not expect our members to be busy and fruitful winning new souls to Jesus. No, during the week, they're busy at their jobs earning money so that on Sunday, they can bring generous tithes and offerings for us. Therefore, the primary means of evangelism in not a few churches is the Sunday service. So, we pastors, we encourage our members to bring new people to church on Sunday mornings to hear the gospel. So, we pastors often design our Sunday messages also with newcomers in mind. As a result, very little solid food is provided in order to disciple believers on Sunday mornings in church. Very little solid food. Instead, it's mostly milk and candy and not a few churches. All right. I'm not saying every church does this, but most churches do this. Sunday morning, what do they get? Milk and candy. We love candy. Therefore, real discipleship does not take place on Sunday mornings in church. No. Now, did the Lord intend for most ministry to take place in church once a week on Sunday morning? Was that the Lord's intention? No, no, no. Thus, few typical believers can mature in Christ. The Sunday messages cannot be too challenging. No but rather seeker-sensitive to draw people to church so that the church can grow in the number of members. Is this pleasing to the Lord, who commands us to disciple all nations, including all believers? Of course not. Here, I found an article on the internet. Should a church be seeker-sensitive? All right, let me read to you what I found. In recent years, a new movement within the evangelical church has come into vogue, commonly referred to as seeker-sensitive. Generally, this movement has seen a great deal of growth, not surprisingly. Many seeker churches are now mega churches with well-known pastors who are riding a wave of popularity in the evangelical world. <laughs> now, do you see the culture of the West in seeker-sensitive churches? Do we see Western culture there? The seeker-sensitive movement claims millions of conversions commands vast resources hmm, and continues to gain popularity and seems to be attracting millions of unchurched people into its fold along with their tithes and offerings.
The seeker-sensitive church movement has pioneered a new method for founding churches involving demographic studies and community surveys that ask the unsaved what they want in a church, not what the Lord wants. No, 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 no. We want to find out what the unbelievers want so that they'll come to our church with their tithes and offerings, of course. This is a kind of, if you build it, they will come mentality. The reasoning is that if you give the unsaved better entertainment that they can receive anywhere else or do church in a non-threatening way, then they will come and hopefully they will accept the gospel. God loves you. God wants to bless you and your family. Just say the sinner's prayer. All of your sins will forgiven. And you have a guaranteed one-way trip to heaven for you and your family. Just keep coming to church every Sunday with your tithes and offerings. The mindset is to hook the unchurched person with great entertainment. Give him a message he can digest. That means milk and candy, of course. And provide second-to-none services like a nice parking lot. And a nice... Um, what do they call it? A nice place to take care of the babies. The focus of the secret church is not Christ-centered, but man-centered. This is, of course, the influence of the culture of the West. The main purpose of the secret church's existence is to give people what they want. Not what the Lord wants, but to give people what they want or to meet their felt needs. This was taken from a website called gotquestions.org. Now, today, churches in non-Western nations, of course, operate in a different non-Western culture. For example, churches in Asia, you operate in a different culture. But since many of these churches were started by servants of God from the West, or at least were modeled after churches in the West, many churches outside the West are following the same pattern as Western churches. They focus on church growth instead of on discipleship. Numbers, 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 church growth. This is a consequence of the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. Jesus says, many will be invited, but few will be chosen. So, churches outside the West have also been heavily influenced by the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. As a result, on Sunday morning, on a Sunday morning in most churches around the world, we will very rarely hear certain scriptures taught, scriptures which are very difficult to digest, which will not encourage them to keep coming Sunday after Sunday after sunning. They're very challenging. For example, let me give you some examples of scriptures which are very, very rarely taught in many churches. Luke 13, someone asked Jesus, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Are only a few people going to heaven? He said to them, make every effort, every effort. Coming to church once a week on Sundays <laughs> is not enough. Make every effort to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter through the narrow door, which is Jesus. Many will try to enter by coming to church. Many will try to enter by becoming a Christian and will not be able to. This is totally inconsistent with the emphasis on church growth in terms of numbers of members. Jesus said, Many will try to enter the kingdom of God. Many will try to go to heaven through Jesus Christ. He's talking about Christians, but will not be able to. Hmm. Who is the narrow door? The narrow door is Jesus. Many will try to enter through Jesus and will not be able to. 
Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open the door for us. Jesus, I went to church every Sunday. I took Holy Communion. Open the door, Jesus. But Jesus will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, hey, Jesus, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. Lord, we went to church every Sunday. We listened to your word. We took Holy Communion once a month. We listened to the street preacher. But Jesus will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Are you going to hear this in a seeker-sensitive church, in a Nicolaitan church? I don't think so. Away from me, all you evildoers, the Lord says. It seems he's talking to Christians. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Hey, what about salvation by grace through faith and not by works? What is this heavenly reward according to what they have done? <laughs> and so what Jesus is saying here is that we will be rewarded not just according to what we have believed or simply according to our faith, but according to what we have done because of our genuine saving faith. If you have genuine saving faith, yes, you will be saved through your faith, not by works. But if your faith is genuine faith, it will result in good works. It will result in deeds done in obedience to the Lord's commands. And the Lord will reward you in his kingdom according to what you have done. And that reward will be authority to reign with Jesus in his kingdom above and beyond eternal life. That's the reward Jesus is talking about here. But this is not taught in most churches. We are taught you are saved by grace through faith, not by works. Just say the sinner's prayer and keep coming every Sunday with your tithes and offerings. And you have a guaranteed one-way ticket to heaven. Matthew 7, verse 13, Jesus says, through he says to his disciples, his disciples are listening, enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many, 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 many enter through it, but small is the gate, narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it, a few. You think that's going to encourage seeker-sensitive people to keep cunning to church if they hear something like that? They go to church in order to feel good about themselves. They go to church in order to have their felt needs met. But they hear a message like this, only a few will be saved. Huh? Do you think they're going to keep coming to that church? Matthew twenty-two fourteen, 14, Jesus says, for many are invited. But few are chosen. In today's church, influenced by the teaching of the Nicolaitans, such verses are rarely taught. Why? Because we pastors, we tend to want big numbers. And so we instead teach easy believism and cheap grace. Once you say the sinner's prayer, your guaranteed salvation. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Don't worry about it. Just keep coming to church every Sunday. For me, that's easy believism and cheap grace, not supported by the verses that we just studied. Let me share with you some prophetic scriptures for the church in the very last days. And uh, here we are reviewing what we taught last week. Matthew 12, verse 43. When an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. 
When it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, and put in order. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself, and they go in and live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is how it will be with this wicked generation. So Jesus here is actually talking about this wicked generation, not just a person who was demonized and got set free, but he's talking about this wicked generation. How do we apply this? Well, we can apply this contrast between Israel under Moses, where an impure spirit comes out of a person under Moses. The Lord led Israel out of slavery in Egypt, eventually into the promised land. So there you have an impure spirit coming out of a person. The impure spirit came out of the nation of Israel when they were set free from slavery in Egypt. Now, much later, 1400 years later, the condition of Israel as led by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law in the time of Jesus was deplorable. You know how Jesus confronted the Pharisees because of their hypocrisy, their greed, love of money and honor and respect. The condition of Israel was deplorable at that time when Jesus appeared. And so, during the time of Jesus, the condition of Israel was worse than the first. The condition of Israel at the time of the leadership, at the time of Jesus, when the Jews were led by the Pharisees, that final condition was worse than when the Israelites came out of Egypt under God's holy prophet Moses. Now, we can also apply the same contrast, this very same contrast between the early church and Acts, where an impure spirit came out of a person, the inspiration impure spirit came out of that generation in the book of Acts and the church today where the final condition of that person is worse than the first. This is what has happened to this wicked generation. The lukewarm church today is a far cry from the early church in the book of Acts, which took the gospel to the ends of the known world with power. You read the book of Acts. And you say, wow, praise God, This, the church in the book of Acts was so powerful, was so holy, was so obedient. But you look at the church today in the 21st century. Look at the comparison. Yes, the final condition of that generation is worse than the first. The final condition of the church today is far worse than it was. 2,000 years ago. Now, let me share with you a prophecy from the book of Romans for the church, especially the church in the West, during these very last days. Look what Paul says. Romans 1, verse 21, A, for although they knew God, okay, so Paul is referring to a people who knew God. So to whom does they refer? To whom is Paul referring to when he says they knew God? Well, he's referring, of course, to a people who already know the one true God. That is who knew God, right? So they in this verse here, refers to a people who knew God, who already knew Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, for although they knew God, they, this people who knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile over time. Their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. So Paul is talking about a people who at one time had light in their hearts. At, what, at one time, they knew and believed in the one true God at one time. But then their foolish hearts were darkened 
their thinking became futile. Their foolish hearts were darkened. And then Paul says about this people, although they, he's talking about the same people, the people who at one time knew God, who knew Jesus, although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Now, this refers to those who claim to be wise, who claim to know God, and who claim to know the way to God. But look at Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. A fool, someone who is a fool, will say, hey, come on, there is no God. But now, they, the people who claim to be wise and who claim to know God, but now they say there is no God. And this has been fulfilled in the post-Christian West, which now says there is no God and are now fools. We in the West, the culture in the West claims to be wise. We have all the science, this technology, but we have become fools. Why? Because now we say science is God, technology is God. There is no God. We have become fools, referring to Western culture. We who at one time knew God, knew Jesus. Because of this, Paul says, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men. Now, homosexuality and gay marriage are now celebrated in post-Christian Western culture. Now they have events called pride events where homosexuals can be proud of being a homosexual. But in non-Western cultures outside of the West, they abhor homosexuality and gay marriage. They abhor it. And so something has gone wrong with Western culture. Western culture has even gone beyond what Paul mentioned in Romans 1 when he mentioned homosexuality. Now, transsexuals are celebrated in mainstream Western culture. If a man wants to become a woman, praise God. If a woman wants to become a man, praise God. We have the science, we have the medical knowledge and understanding to be able to change a man into a woman and a woman to a man. It's celebrated. It is taught in schools to our young children. If you're not sure that you're a boy, if you're not comfortable that you're a boy, hey, it's okay. You can become a girl. <laughs> and non-binary people are celebrated. What is non-binary? That means someone who is neither a man nor a woman. <laughs> they are something else. LGBTQIA plus is celebrated. I'm not sure what that means, but LGBTQ I know means lesbian, gay, bisexual, uh, transsexual, queer, I, A, I'm not sure what that means. And the plus, that means there's all kinds of things you can do, which God hates, which is forbidden in the word of God. But now these activities, this behavior is celebrated. It is said that there are now over 100 genders to choose from, <laughs> not just two, but 100. This is what is happening in Western culture, being accepted by the mainstream Western culture. Oh, let me introduce you to a man named Sam Britton. He is Joe Biden's former Deputy Assistant Secretary for Spent Fuel and Waste Disposition at the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy. He was formerly employed by Joe by excuse me, by Joe Biden. Why? Because he was caught stealing luggage at an airport terminal when he got off the plane. He was time after time caught stealing luggage containing valuable things. Sam Britton, Mr. Sam Britton. Okay, this is celebrated now in Western culture. 
if a young man feels like he is a woman, in some places in Western countries, he can legally go to a woman's bathroom. If he feels like a woman, go ahead. You can go to a woman's bathroom. You can go to a woman's locker room after you exercise. People who protest and stand up for traditional values, traditional Judeo-Christian values, are being canceled or threatened with loss of status or job. Hmm, persecution now. Non-Christian cultures, that is, in the third world, they view homosexuality and transsexual ideology as abominations. It's ridiculous. Abominations. And they are not, these behaviors, these things are not sanctioned in nations dominated by Islam, by Hinduism, by Buddhism, animism, and idol worship. The unbelievers are now doing better than the post-Christian Western nations. Why has this taken place in the post-Christian West? It is due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. In terms of accepting homosexuality and transsexual ideology, nations dominated by Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, animism, and outer worship, they're doing better in terms of Judeo-Christian values. The final condition of that person is worse than the first. At one time, the West was doing very well. They accepted Jesus Christ. There was transformation in the culture of the West. The culture of the West was blessed. The culture became Judeo-Christian culture with Judeo-Christian values. And so God blessed Western nations. But now, the final condition of that person is worse than the first. How is this possible, you might ask? This will be explained at our next session. But let me add this, Romans 128, Paul says, furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, meaning they once had the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. This is now being fulfilled in Western culture. We do things that should not be done. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit. They are gossip, slanderers, God haters. According to verses 28 and 29 above, God-haters did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, meaning at one time they had the knowledge of God, but they thought that it was not worthwhile to retain it, so now they be, have become God-haters. Now they hate God. This clearly means that at one time God-haters did in fact have the knowledge of God, that is the one true God who created the heavens and the earth, that is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. These God-haters used to be Christians. God, in verse 28, as in the knowledge of God, does not refer to the false god of Islam or to the false gods of Hinduism or to the false gods of the many religions found on earth. No, it can only refer to our Father in heaven, the one true God. And the only way to know the Father, of course, is through his Son, Jesus Christ. God-haters in Romans 1, therefore, must refer to a people who once followed Jesus Christ, known as Christians, but who have now renounced God entirely and are now following Satan. They hate God and what God has ordained. For example, they hate having only two genders, male and female. They hate the teaching about their sin nature from the Bible. And that teaching limits their freedom to do whatever pleases their flesh. For example, a man becoming a woman or a man giving birth to children. Of course, God forbids such things. God limits their freedom 
to do such things. And they hate that teaching that limits their freedom to do whatever pleases their sinful nature. They hate it. They hate the Lord's commands to be holy. They hate the Lord's commands to avoid sexual immorality. They hate the Lord's command to avoid fornication, adultery, promiscuity. They hate having to value life in a mother's womb. They consider it a woman's right to choose to murder the unborn child in her womb. I have some experience in this area. When I was in my mother's womb, I was to be aborted, but God saved me. This is an accurate description of what has taken place in the mainstream culture of the West. As a result, Romans 1, regarding the widespread acceptance of homosexuality, has been fulfilled in the post-Christian West. And of course, Western culture has now gone far beyond simply the acceptance of homosexuality, now to include other unimaginable perversions as well as mentioned earlier. The condition is worse than at first. How is it possible that Western culture, Western nations, from which missionaries took the life-giving gospel to third world countries in past centuries, have now given birth to God-haters? How is that possible? How could the Western nations who sent forth the likes of William Carey, the missionary to India, missionary Hudson Taylor to China, famous missionaries, David Livingston to Africa, Amy Wilson Carmichael, Eric Liddell to China, David Brainerd to proclaim the kingdom of God to those who never heard in the third world. How could those countries, very same countries, have spawned God haters? How? We will see at our next session. Now, the teaching to come in the next few weeks does not apply to every church in the world, no. Rather, it applies to the church in general as she exists today, especially the church in the post-Christian West, and as a result, her daughter churches in other countries around the world as well. At our next session, we're going to study the teaching of the Nicolaitans part two. And that will consist of the perversion of the original intent of the gospel, and also the marketplace of Christianity in the West. So, we hope to see you in a week. Thank you for joining us. We, are, we have run out of time, so we're not going to relate more adventures, missionary adventures in Indonesia that we had experienced many years ago. Uh, we will continue with that next week. So. Thank you for joining us. I pray that this teaching, yes, will have impact upon your ministry for the gospel of Jesus Christ.